Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free 30-day trial and and audiobook download by going to audibletrial.com slash queer. And again, that's audibletrial.com slash queer. Sign up today, you little queer shins, get yourself an audiobook. And welcome back to Your Career Story. We are your hosts. I'm the dribble in the corner of your grandmother's mouth, Evan Jones. And I'm the stale cookie you forgot in the oven last week, Paul Hobbs. And we have an extra guest today because we're talking about lesbians. We thought we should have a woman's voice. And we with us is... And I'm Samantha Taylor, the person who puts up with these two people. And thank you for joining us today, honey. So we are excited to have you here as we discuss some strong women in queer history and the interesting phenomenon of the Wellesley marriages. Remember, this episode and all the previous ones are, avail- are available on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and wherever else you get your podcast. You can also find us on basically every form of social media under At Your Queer Story. And if you're looking for additional support or just for more interaction with the queer community, then you can join our Facebook support group, or go to our website for tips and advice on our blog posts. We also will be hosting meetups in our area, and you can find information about these on our pages. And we really encourage you all to use this platform to set up your own meetups and socializing events in your area. Face-to-face interactions are very healthy and beneficial, especially in marginalized communities. We had a a meetup here recently, and we've got another one in Rhode Island. We have another one planned soon. Um, And the meet it went really great. It's been a lot of fun. It's nice to connect with people face-to-face. So get out there and meet each other. So speaking of marginalized communities, let's dive into the topic of Wellesley marriages. It was hard to woe, most beautiful friend, to watch your bright hair wither, shoulder bend, beneath the burden, white as carrier dove, your numb, forgetful hand, an empty glove, lies on a quiet breast, the hard gasps rend no longer. From the broken cage ascend, God's homing bird, to boundless air above, your joy shall be my joy, eh? Though the word chokes to a sob, my tragedy is done." These were the words written by author, feminist, and activist Catherine Lee Bates upon the passing of her figurative wife, Catherine Coleman. The two women had been joined together for 25 years, and Coleman's death in 1915 was devastating to Bates. In an era still rebuilding from the atrocities of the Civil War, some women found a way to break free from the patriarchy. They established homes, careers, and even same-sex marriages for those who had no interest in men. Though these marriages were not recognized legally, socially they were respected. And while these marriages were recognized nationally as Boston marriages, there was a subset of women who drew particular attention, the women of Wellesley College. Founded in 1875, Wellesley was an all-female university from its students to its staff. I mean, it's probably the place to go. I'm just (laughs) saying, I I, I don't know. I probably would have gone there. You probably. I mean, if you're like... I like women, and this place is entirely women. Where can I go to find women? Where, 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 where? Probably the school. (laughs) Do I want to go to all the colleges that only have men, where I'll be the only woman? (laughs) (laughs) The founders, Pauline and Henry Durant, were dedicated to funding higher education for women in America and established the college in Wellesley, Massachusetts. The college still runs strong today as a women's liberal arts university, And of the 13 presidents, every single one has been a female. Catherine Bates enrolled almost immediately and graduated in 1880 with honors. She later went off to Oxford University to earn her master's degree before returning to campus in 1886. Yeah, so we're going to talk a lot about um, different women. We're going to talk about uh, six women, five in particular in this podcast that were all uh, somehow in the Wellesley realm. Um, but Catherine Lee Bates, which is not to be confused with Kathy Bates or Kathy Lee or any of the other Kathys, um, was, uh, she's the most prominent, um, if, uh, the most prominent graduate of Wellesley. And it is interesting that it's still going on today. The college is still there mm-hmm. and I'm sure it is still inhabited by many, many lesbians. A few years before Bates made it back to Wellesley, the university hired a bright young economist and historian, Catherine Coleman. 
Coleman had graduated from an all-female seminary in Ohio before pursuing her Ph.D. at Michigan State University. She was one of only a few women to graduate from the program during this time period. Ridiculously smart and passionate about social justice, Coleman brought this enthusiasm to the new women's college at Wellesley. Coleman's research in economics heavily influenced understanding of social issues at the time. She was greatly concerned about the poor living conditions of the working class, particularly minorities. She traveled around the country speaking out against these injustices with prominent feminists such as her good friend, Jane Addams. Yeah, so if you know your lesbian history, you definitely know the name Jane Addams. And it's actually kind of sad that we don't know Catherine Coleman more because during in that day, she was very well known. She was just as popular as Catherine Bates and Jane Addams and all the strong women who were part of the women's suffrage movement of this time, um, also heavily involved in the labor rights unions and movements. Um, so she was very well known, but then she just kind of disappeared on off the scene. Um, and I, I just, I think that because the other women kind of, um, had a huge achievement. Yes. The difference is she was extremely, she was equally as active as them. Yes. But the others just happened to have something that went like viral in today's term. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Viral in that term. And by viral, we mean all through the newspapers, yeah. but they had a really la- a lasting impact, something significantly like Jane Adams, who, you know, created housing for women and, and, um, uh, created housing for women in Chicago as well as many other uh, things. So, the, you know, they had physical items that they left. While Coleman did have a lot of books that she left, a lot of her effects were more social than a, like a physical attribute. Mm-hmm. It is certain that Bates and Coleman met when Bates came on staff in 1886, yet a relationship was not formed for another four years. Perhaps this was due to the distractions of the many other lesbians on campus. And Wellesley was full of lesbians. Romantic relationships between two women were so common that people stopped referring to these partnerships as Boston marriages and simply called them Wellesley marriages. Though we must add that we do not know how many of these relationships were actually physical. So this is important too. Uh, Um, I would like to say as a person that identified as a lesbian in college, it took me about four years to... um actually get with my girlfriend in college too so maybe it's just a lesson yeah no no i think that that's um i think that that's that's like that should be said i don't know what happened i don't know if they were you know dating other women or if maybe Catherine bates because um it seemed that coleman uh had come out like was pretty active in dating women but uh Catherine bates was a couple years younger and maybe she hadn't quite discovered that about herself or maybe they were just dating other people but one thing about any of these relationships is we'll talk about women that were together for decades, but we don't know they're sexual. But see, it's also, <laughs> you can't really say that you know that people are sexually active with exactly. each other. So regardless, I mean, you can't just say... It's easy. You, you can't really say, oh, we don't know if they're gay because we don't know if they're having sex. Or, yeah. Because people don't know what goes on behind closed doors. You can yeah. assume right. that people have sex. But I mean, unless there's like a leaked porno or something of that couple you don't yeah. really know unless they open like talk who, about who it. really believes that that uh trump and melania are having sex come on i mean they had sex about 12 years ago when they had their kid but other than that are they having sex well nobody knows married couples we don't know we assume that they've had sex at some point in their life are they still actively having sex we don't know so basically what we're saying is that sex in a relationship obviously does not define a relationship exactly a relationship is so much more than that and um so we don't really need to know if these women actually had sex in the whole time they were in a relationship exactly. yeah we don't we don't need to know but of course everybody speculates and wonders and people put the how deep or important the relationship was based on this and it has right. absolutely nothing to do with it yeah uh, but the point is so sex is a physical act Mm-hmm. And while uh, there are definitely some emotional aspects of it that go into that um, physical act, you don't have to have that physical act to have that emotional connection and to build that aspect of the relationship. Exactly. The point is that these women in 1915? No, uh, well, that was later. So this is late 1800s. This is 1880, right. so 90. in 1880 and 90, to have a deep connection with a woman and consider them your, like, equal in a relationship, regardless of what sex they were having, was, like, pretty... Pretty amazing. Out. Yeah, oh, pretty yeah. Amazing. Because so. society demanded that you get married, right? Yep. 
society's like, you got to go off. You got to find a man. And these women are like, no, fuck you. Mm-hmm. We're going to, I'm going to find this woman. I'm going to commit to her. And they were, they were committed. They were committed physically in that they were always together. They were committed emotionally. They were committed spiritually to one another. They lived together. They were even together. committed in their work. Oh yeah, like their 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 goals in life, they were committed in everything. Whether or not they had sex doesn't Those really matter. Is irrelevant. Exactly. Because women were expected to step down from their positions once finding a husband, many females in the academia world linked together as a way to avoid any kind of domestication. A fear of having to settle down and follow society's standards for women certainly drove some women to abandon the idea of conventional marriage, even if they weren't sexually attracted to their chosen female partner. However, for women who were lesbian or bisexual, places like Wellesley created a safe haven and sort of utopia at a time when severe consequences would have applied otherwise. Jeanette Marks and Mary Woolley were among the freed lesbians living in the gay haven at Wellesley. Mary Woolley, known as May, was one of Rhode Island's own natives. Born in Connecticut and moving to Pawtucket, Rhode Island at age 8, May grew up just 20 minutes away from where we are recording today. She even attended Providence High School before going on to become the first woman enrolled in Brown University, which has since become quite a female-dominated school. And very queer. And very queer. Very queer-friendly. And progressive. Yes. She earned both her bachelor's in, ni- in 1894 and her master's in 1895 from the renowned college. That same year, Woolley went off to head the Biblical History and Literature Department at Wellesley. While teaching, she met a student who caught her eye named Jeanette Marks. Twelve years Mays Jr., Jeanette Marks was a very active and very beautiful young woman. Her father was an engineer and president of the Philadelphia Edison Company. And perhaps this contributed to Jeanette's love of science and research, second only to her loves of poetry and literature. <laughs> Later, <laughs> Go for all of the that's, all of these women loved poetry and literature. You're going to be shocked. Later in life, she would publish several books and works on narcotics and drug addiction. But before that, she would meet the love of her life somewhere during her time at Wellesley. Marx and Woolley fell madly in love and would be together for the next fifty years. But what's really important is whether they were having sex. <laughs> However, their time at Wellesley was short-lived. When Marx graduated with her bachelor's in 1900, Woolley took a position as president of Mount Holyoke College, where she would remain for the next 36 years. One of her first orders was to establish Jeanette as instructor of the English department. Okay, so I think she was fucking her to get that position. I'm just saying. Both women continued to hold very active and influential careers in the world of education, as well as in the national sphere. They were both members of the National Women's Party, the first organization to advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment, and their political activism did not go unnoticed. President Hoover appointed Woolley as the only woman delegate for the United States Conference on Reduction and Limitation of Armaments held in 1932. So, I mean, both these women were well known, and that all of these women were known all around the country. They were known... By name, obviously, Wooly was known by the president. Like they were very active on all on all fronts, and um, and very impactful. And they and and people respected them. And people didn't say Wellesley marriages in a derogative term. They said it in like, a, oh yeah, those women have you know decided to be together. And some some did actually say they were married. They would just say those two women are married, and others would just say, oh, they're part of a Wellesley marriage to kind of describe the relationship. While Jeanette and May were just leaving Wellesley, a new romance was blossoming between Professors Bates and Coleman. In 1891, Bates wrote to Coleman, It was never very possible to leave Wellesley for good, because so many love anchors held me there, and it seemed least of all possible when I had just found the long-desired way to your dearest heart. Of course, I want to come to you, very much as I want to come to heaven. The two women each traveled extensively and were often apart, though they were constantly in each other's thoughts. You were always in my heart and in my longings. Bates wrote in another letter. Catherine Bates had quite a way with words and as early as 1889 was gaining national prominence for her writing. She is attributed with popularizing the idea of Mrs. Claus through her children's poem, Goody Santa Claus on a Sleigh Ride, published that year. She wrote for countless publications, including many Christian journals, often under the pseudonym James Lincoln. Despite her religion's objections to her lifestyle, Bates always maintained a strong connection to her Congregationalist faith. 
And this is shown in her most enduring gift to Americans, which came in the form of a song. A song that rivaled the Star-Spangled Banner for a place as the national anthem. Its title, America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. That's like a mic drop moment. <laughs> skies, for amber waves of gray. Samantha just threw that in there for you guys. We didn't ask you to do it, but she did it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that song that everybody is singing and all of the religious right, the oh, yeah. song that was sang at Trump's inauguration yep. was written by a lesbian, everybody. Mic drop. Also, I want to say that in doing research for this, as I, as I, when I, it would depend on what I was looking for. I had to specifically say like Catherine Bates and Catherine Coleman or Catherine Bates lesbian to get any information. If I just put in America the Beautiful or Catherine Bates, most of the research completely left that out. Oh yeah, that was not included anywhere. Oh, I was yeah. actually listening to a like small documentary on YouTube where this woman who actually wrote a biography and she's literally being interviewed and she's like, yeah, she had two male lovers, oh. blah, blah, blah. This woman was a lesbian and it is completely erased from all history books yep. except for... I mean, you actually have to search for it because it's just hidden. Yeah. Nobody wants this beautiful song on of America to be written by somebody other than a straight white person. They just don't. It's exactly. Hidden. Exactly. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's she, for 25 years, she is dedicated completely to Catherine Coleman. And everyone's like, I don't know. She's just one of those girls and never found the right guy. They were roommates. <laughs> they just lived together. That's all it was. Just a couple of good girls. It's like the way my mom treats me and Samantha. We're just a couple of good roommates. I don't know why you can't just live together, but, you know, and yeah. have separate rooms. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I, it, I, it is frustrating when you read it. So, you have to actually dig for this. And it's really only been in more recent years that it's even come out. Yeah, it was extremely hidden. So, I, I when we do research on this, I find a lot of interesting information. This is the first one that actually made me mad. Yeah. Because this is such an iconic song and an iconic part of American history. Yep. It's like almost like the national anthem and it's just never talked about that she was a lesbian no never mentioned just I, I and you know what um it's interesting you know with my fundamentalist past in my church they loved america the beautiful oh my god shit their pants over it because it's, it's a song that talks about god it talks about god's creation basically and so you know christians and fundamental christians especially love this song and and they should it's a beautiful song but they, you know, it's interesting that the song that they fawn over is written by someone that they think shouldn't even have the right to exist. Definitely shouldn't have the right to live with her, to cohabitate with her partner, you know. And it, it, I don't know, it shows the hypocrisy and it shows why, I mean, I'm, I am grateful that we were not kept from the song because... Oh yeah, songs, I, I, yeah, I'm very glad that it wasn't like, oh, this person's a lesbian, shut this song down, like... Yeah. We'll come up with something better. They just because ignored it. It's truly a beautiful song. It really is. It, mm -hmm. it, it's just, fr and it actually wasn't written as a song. It was written as a poem. Yes. And later, in, um, later it was just put to music. Like later they turned it into a song. Yeah. It was written as a beautiful poem by a lesbian author living with her lesbian lover. At an all women's college, cohorting around with a bunch of other lesbians. It's really gay. Mm -hmm. So the story goes that in 1893, Catherine was working in Colorado, where she often taught during the summers. Amber waves of grain. She's talking about her lover's hair. <laughs> now I'm going to decipher the whole song. Oh yeah, Paul's just going to make this whole thing about uh, Catherine's lover. Who... Oh, beautiful for spacious eyes. Just saying. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm deciphering it. Okay, right. great. According to her, Catherine... One day, some of the other teachers and I decided to go on a trip to 14,000 foot Pikes Peak. We hired a prairie wagon. Near the top, we had to leave the wagon and go the rest of the way on mules. I was very tired, but when I saw the view, I felt great joy. All the wonder of America seemed displayed there, with the sea like expanse. Base. America, America. You can download her song on <laughs> iTunes. <laughs> Samantha's trying to promote her new uh, <laughs> album. Just a little slide it in there. <laughs> no. She does have a beautiful voice, though. Bates hastily jotted down her thoughts in a notebook, and the first draft of America the Beautiful was written. Two years later, it would appear for the Independence Day edition of the Congregationalist, a weekly Christian journal. 
Over the next two decades, the poem slowly gained more prominence and popularity. Though when Catherine published her 1912 book, America the Beautiful, one of the poem's critics wrote, We intend no derogation to Miss Catherine Lee Bates when we say that she's a good minor poet. If she had a dick in her life, she'd probably be a great oh, major yeah. poet. She just had a good man to help her with her writing because we got intended it. Hey Queerstians, thanks for listening to today's episode of Your Queer Story. Audible is offering a free audiobook download with your free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I love Audible. I have had my subscription for over two years and it is worth every single penny. I listen to it all the time. I hate to read, but I love listening to things while I work. Audible gives me the opportunity to listen to the best-selling books while I'm at my computer or driving and makes the day fly by. And the best part is that Audible offers a wide variety of queer-friendly books as well. So you can listen to anything from The Queer History of the United States by Michael Bronski to over 200 LGBTQ fantasy novels. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com queer. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash queer for your free audiobook. The poem had three official versions and was put to several different tunes before Americans settled on one by Samuel Ward as the song they liked the best. In 1930, many Americans lobbied to have America the Beautiful made the national anthem. However, Key's Star Spangled Banner won out in the end, even though the debate actually still continues to this and day. And it's true. You can find forums today where people are still arguing about whether the Star Spangled Banner or America the Beautiful should be the national anthem. <laughs> if you want something to do in your free time. <laughs> Regardless, the song was enough to solidify Bates' status in history. In 1970, she was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Now, while Bates was most remembered due to her infamous song, Coleman was also just as prominent during this time, as I said earlier, traveling all around the world to study the social issues women, immigrants, and the poor faced. In 1901, she became the first chair of economics and sociology at Wellesley. One of her closest friends at this time was, was Vida Scudder. Vita Dutton Scudder was the daughter of American missionaries to India. Upon the death of her father, Vita and her mother returned to Boston. In 1884, she graduated from Smith College before going off to Oxford. A proud Episcopalian her entire life, Vita used her Christian ties to aid in the social reform of the impoverished. In fact, before the political shift of the 1950s, Christians and socialists were nearly one and the same. This, a lot of people don't know this. Christians and socialists. I thought all Christians were Republicans. No, no, no. They were socialists. That's why, and I'm going to say it again, you need to go read One Nation Under God by Kevin and Cruz because it talks about how... Which, it would make sense if Christians were socialists. Yeah, because that's what Christianity is supposed to be. (laughs) It's literally supposed to be socialism. But you know what? No, they're Republicans. And if you're not white and you don't have a really high paying job for some reason because your dad was some rich person, then you're probably right. just not really an American Look, it's just or a Christian. You're God, not really a Christian. It's just that God's blessed straight white Americans because we follow his word. It's not that we're against the rest of the people. It's not that we slaughtered everyone else and took no, 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 no. God yeah. blessed us. That's how we got it. No, but it's true. Christian and socialism was the same thing. Because it makes sense. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Christians were doing. And then in the 1950s, 40s, really going into the 1950s, it got politicized. And now it was about who's in charge of the White House and how can we get our dogma taught. There were too many other diverse groups coming out, you know, with the labor unions and women's suffragette and, and, and queer individuals coming out into the spotlight. More minorities were becoming visible and taking hold in America in American government and capitalism and uh, American government and business. As all these things happened and more diverse opinions that are out there, now white, straight Christians are afraid that they're losing their voice and so they're politicizing their religion rather than using it for what it was intended for. And by politicizing their religion, that just means that they are using it to put everybody else down so that they can remain in power. Exactly. That's all it means. It's all about control, folks. Sutton came on as a literature professor at Wellesley in 1887 and stayed on for the next 40 years, even though her social work often took her away for bits at a time. While at Wellesley, Vita dated many women. However, her heart was finally won by Florence Converse in 1919. The two remained together for the next 35 years until Sutton's death in 1954. 
And like Bates and Coleman, the two were often separated, mostly due to Vita's socialist activism. However, in death, they remained close as they were buried near each other in Newton, Massachusetts. A few years ago, the Episcopal Church added Vita Scudder to their Book of Saints. Yeah, the Episcopalians are a little more liberal. Um, wh- what was I going to say? Um, oh, God. So these, there's a lot more to these women's lives, and we're trying to talk about them being at Wellesley and how Wellesley affected the, the nation and the Wellesley marriages. So we haven't delved deep into any of their lives. We're talking, well, more about Catherine Lee Bates and her partner, Catherine Coleman. But, um, you know, Sutton and, um, or not, sorry, not Sutton, Scudder and um, Converse and, uh, you know, Wooly um, were all women that were very prominent during this time. And there's a lot, I mean, we'll probably talk about each of them or at least each couple in depth later on. Um, but the thing about um, Scudder is that she, the thing about Scudder is that she was very devoted to her faith and she was very much interested in spreading and using her faith for good and using her Christian works for good. And that's one reason why she was made a saint. She, everything she did in her life was somehow tied to that. And it's interesting as well. Again, we don't know what went on behind closed doors, but it's interesting again that this, we have two lesbians very devoted to their faith, even though they're, even though it was certainly was not spoken of approvingly at this time. Right. You know. Um, but they used their faith for what it was supposed to be for. Exactly. Which is the difference between everybody else at the time. Well, not everybody else, but a majority of the people at the time. Yeah, well, at least the difference from the way that things shifted later on. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how you can, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a queer person of faith at all, but that's my own personal choice. Um, but there are a lot of queer people of faith, um, or uh, yeah, POFs, people of faith, I guess that's the term they use, um, out there that, main, that find a way to reconcile their religion of their past or to find a new religion that works for them today. And this story just shows that that can happen. There's also a lot of uh, queer people that identify as Episcopalian because it continues to be like a very progressive church. <clears throat> so it's not too surprising that that's the church that she... Yeah. Became a saint then. Yep. No, it's, if you um, go to downtown Providence, there's like a really pretty church that has a gay flag outside of them. That's Episcopalian? That's Episcopalian. And yeah. the gay flag's there just like all the time. They're the kind of people that put a flag out for pride and are like, yeah, I guess we'll just leave it. That's good. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. I know that she also did some work with Unitarians and so did Catherine Lee Bates. And I mean, I know that Unitarians have been longtime supporters of, you know, the queer community. Um, so it's just something to think about, you know, as you're out there, there are, there are resources out there if you're interested in continuing in your faith, you know. And uh, actually, Evan, in the future, will write a blog post on yep. can you be queer and religious? Yeah, if you want to hear it from me, but I will I'll write it on being queer and religious. I'm not the best opinion, but I can at least give provide some resources. But if you've you want also to look more been through it. an extensive amount of religion. I've been in a lot of religion. And it's all, all comes down to interpretation. Yeah. I've been in a lot of, um, yeah, I know a lot about religion at least. So you've been through a lot of religion and I, (laughs) and I thought about that that would make a good article, um, for our listeners. Yeah. But coming from me, I don't have any experience in religion, so it just wouldn't make sense coming from me. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it all comes down to interpretation, folks. It all comes down to what you believe and how you want to interpret it. And I think that any person can find a faith that works for them if they want it. And if you don't, you just don't to interject one. here, that's perfectly okay. You know? I am non-religious. Yep. So is Evan. Yep. Um, I don't know about Sam, but <laughs> I, I think that everybody should be able to believe and feel how they want, so long as they're not impose, attempting to impose those beliefs on others that do not want those beliefs imposed on them. Exactly. Right. If someone's like, if you go to someone and they say, I'm an atheist, don't try to convert them to your religion. And, and, and on the other side, because we all know that atheists can be assholes as well. If someone comes to you and says, I believe in a God, I have a deep faith, don't throw it back at them like, well, what are you thinking? Where's the evidence? What's your proof? Who cares? Who really gives a fuck? As long as people aren't being harassed and aren't being belittled and maligned, as long as you're not forcing everyone to follow your beliefs, then who gives a fuck what they believe? Do what gives you peace. One of the tasks Catherine Coleman and Vita Dutton Scudder are most well known for is their organization of the Chicago Garment Worker Strike of 1910 to 1911. The strike was led by women 
who are fed up with the poor conditions in the garment factories. After wages were cut once again on September 22, 1910, 16 women went on strike. By the end of the week, 2,000 women had joined. Not long later, the union sanctioned the strike, and 41,000 workers walked off the job. The women stayed on strike for the next five months until better conditions and wages were ratified under a new contract. That's so, people that are getting things done. Yeah. yeah. So can you imagine? You're like, no, nah, sorry, guys. I'm not going to pay you a little bit more. <laughs> well, guess what, buddy? For five months, you're not going to have shit done for you. So guess what? You yeah. lost way more than you would have if you had paid these people what they 41, wanted. 41,000. And the majority of them were women. So women could have jobs at this time. You just had to work in a factory, in an awful factory. Watch Les Mis. And, um, and 41,000 of these women were like, fuck this. And they were working in horrible conditions. They were working ridiculously long hours. They all had missing fingers. They all had missing <laughs> fingers. Yeah, some, some sewing and, and, and malfunctions. They were being paid awful wages. And this is what women like Coleman and Sutter and um, and Wooley were fighting for. And that's what, and Jane Addams, women were touring around and speaking against were these awful labor laws. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're going to talk more about the labor laws in the future because we're going to talk about Emma Goldman and her boyfriend who was a bisexual and the, some of the things that they did. But the the labor uh, conditions in the early 1900s were just despicable. It was disgusting. It was gross. You have an eight hour, you have a 40 hour work week and an eight hour day to day and a paid lunch break because of these women and, and, and other supporters and activists like them. And so, and the garment work strike was just amazing to me. Absolutely. It's incredible. So the woman of Wellesley marriages left many impacts on our country socially, economically, educationally, and politically. Their openness and tireless determination set a standard for all women in America and around the world. Most importantly, they showed young queer women the importance of being true to oneself despite societal norms. And also to love who you will and hold on to them. Of the 53 female staff members employed during Bates and Coma's time, only one was in a conventional marriage, and 43% of graduates during this era never married. Catherine Bates once stated, I always thought the fringe had the best of it. I don't much like being woven in. In January of 1915, Catherine Coleman died of breast cancer. Bates dedicated her book Yellow Clover, a book of remembrance to her lover. We read a passage of it at the beginning of the episode, and you can find it online at archive.org. Catherine, you can also read a little clip where she def, uh, dedicates it to Catherine Coleman. Catherine Bates continued in her writing and activism until her death. During her life, she was able to see women gain the right to vote, as well as great changes in labor laws. Fourteen years after Coleman's death, Catherine Bates died in the same room as her partner while a friend read her poetry. And that is a brief queer story of Wellesley marriages. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Your Queer Story. If you have, please let us know by reaching out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or yourqueerstory.com. Also, please share this podcast with your friends, families, neighbors, and even the creepy guy at the end of your street who's constantly working on his car but never actually driving it. I hate that guy. He's the worst. He's always looking around and he's like... What are you kids up to today? And I'm like, sir, I'm 30. I'm going to work. I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, uh, anything happening in the neighborhood today? I don't know, buddy. You should know. You're the one who's always out here working on your car. Do you actually work or do you just work on Do you car? just lay under that car and stare at people or what the fuck's going on? By the way, make sure you check out yourqueerstory.com. That's how you slip it in there, folks. Yep. Your recommended resource for the day is Yellow Clover, a book of remembrance, which can be found online at archives.org. Again, remember. Also, remember you can grab a free audiobook on us. Just go to audibletrial.com slash queer and stay queer, folks, and don't get a lobotomy and hug a suffering or special sapphist in your life and make sure you say your prayers, queerstians.